Hello, everyone, and welcome to another series of Terribly Famous. No, 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 no. Oh, you, you did it again. I did what? Sorry. Sorry, you said the name of your show, not the name of this show. Oh, I said Terribly Famous. Yeah, you did. Just, just yeah. give it another go. Sorry, I meant to say Terribly... Oh, no, I see what you mean. Yeah, no, yeah. oh my God, I got you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Emily lloyd Saney. This is Terribly Famous. Sorry, Um, you are... I... I said you could like plug it once, but it feels like maybe you're like plugging it like over and over again. <laughs> so, I'm saying terribly famous too much. Yeah. If you could just say British Scandal and then we'll just get into it. And then we'll talk about terribly famous. I think we've talked about it now. So, oh. Yeah. We've probably done that and then we'll just move on from that. Hi, this is Terribly Famous Okay, British. I'm just going to do it. Um, this is British Scandal and this episode may contain some strong language. And references to terribly famous. <sighs> references to terribly famous. <laughs> Saturday, 1st of June, 2013. Mahiki Club, London. Talisa Contestavlos raises her arms skywards and throws her long, dark ponytail from side to side in time to the music. Then she lowers her espresso martini glass back to her lips, draining what's left of it. Fans surround her, cheering her every move. I love you, Talisa. Any chance of a selfie? Talisa happily slings an arm around her and takes the shot herself then carries on dancing. Tonight's celebrations have only just begun. She's just been headhunted by a top Bollywood producer and is about to sign a lucrative movie contract. At just 24, the future is hers for the taking. She feels her phone vibrate in a pocket. The words unknown number flash on the screen. Talisa feels a rush of excitement. Is she gonna find out more about her first Bollywood film? She races into the toilets to answer. Talisa, I'm ringing from the sun on Sunday. Talisa smiles and rolls her eyes. She's not bothered. She should have known details of this deal would leak, though she didn't expect it to happen quite so soon. We're running a splash in tomorrow's paper about you dealing cocaine. Do you want to comment? Talisa's heart thuds in her chest. Her feet feel like they might give way beneath her. She quickly ducks into a cubicle. What? That's not true. Who told you that? I was there, Talisa. Talisa's mouth goes bone dry. She can't make sense of it. The voice goes on. I know exactly what took place, and we've got it all on camera. Still, the reporter keeps talking, and now Talisa recognises the voice. The accent is different, but he has the same soft tone, the same deliberate speech pattern, the same voice as the Bollywood producer she met with only days ago. A feeling of dread overwhelms her. I don't do drugs. I never have. Trembling, Talisa hangs up, then makes her way back through the crowded club. Now the pulsating music makes her feel woozy and ill. Another fan rushes towards her with their phone, but she pushes past them, desperate to escape. Talisa runs outside, gulps in the night air. The contents of her stomach come back up as if the full force of her predicament has hit home. She gave up a judging gig on X Factor for this break went against the advice of her agent, her family, and it was all for a lie. Not only is there no Bollywood deal, she's about to have her name dragged through the mud. She may be facing drug charges, even prison. Questions, comments, concerns at this point? All going to plan. (laughs) I mean, these are the things that make us stronger. So actually, female boss, and I am holding my arm out so that you can read my forearm. She leans against the wall to steady herself. She can still hear the thud of the bass inside, but as she takes deep breaths, it starts to calm her. She hasn't got to where she has in life playing the victim. An image swims into her mind, a hotel room. This producer plying her with booze. Was she conned by some dirtbag reporter? She feels the anger rising in her body. She doesn't know who this man is, but she's not going down without a fight. No reporter is gonna destroy her life. She's going to go after him, fight tooth and nail, and finally expose this tabloid hack for who he really is. That did a somersault. What? She's not bothered. She's fine. Turn that frown upside down. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have, would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying? If you would have asked me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes. But let me tell you, I would have been so wrong. I can't believe how many I had and all the money I was wasting. 
Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. When you get HubSpot Sales Hub, it's like getting a new teammate, an efficient, organized, helpful teammate who's also super easy to work with. The kind of teammate who reduces everyone else's busy work with a new prospecting workspace. A teammate who keeps the entire team focused and on track with easy-to-use deal management tools. A teammate who won't jockey for your promotion or microwave leftover shrimp scampi in the break room. Learn how you can close deals faster and crush your revenue goals with Sales Hub at HubSpot.com sales. From Wondery, I'm Emily lloyd Saney, And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal, the show where we bring you stories from this green and not-so-pleasant land. British scandals come in many shapes and sizes. Some are about money, some are about sex. They are all about power. But when we look at scandals a bit closer, they turn out to be stranger, wilder, just plain weirder than we remember. So we're journeying back to ask, who's to blame for what happened? And when the dust settled... Did anything really change? Alice, it's so nice to join you for a bit of British Scandal. The pleasure is all mine and I feel like it's our destiny to tell the story of a scandal together because you co-present a podcast along similar lines, but your PhD is in (laughs) British celebs. Yes, charting the journey of British celebrities before, during and whatever comes after the fame. But there's always scandal involved, so I feel like the paths should be crossing and quite rightly are now. I'm sure lots of British scandal listeners listen to Terribly Famous as well. But if you don't already, go and check it out and add it to your subscription so that you can kind of have bookends of scandals clouding (laughs) your ears. Another important reason for having you here, Emily, is because you are also from Nottingham. And in Matt's absence, I really felt like we weren't representing. I feel like that's the most important subject you could bring up at this moment. And I think the only problem with that is we're in danger of this whole podcast being about Bramcote Leisure Centre. A niche reference, but it is important to note that we haven't met until now, although spiritually we have, because we probably got our first early infections from the very same ball pit at San Diego. So um, that soft play really unites us and it's really great to be here as fellow survivors. Such a great foundation to start from, isn't it? So Nottingham trivia aside, where should we begin? Well, I may specialise in celebrities. But today, we're going to hear about a man who managed to exploit them. He got scoops on some of the highest profile figures. This is exciting to me because I absolutely love a journalism scandal. This is my area. This is my confection. Now, the really entertaining bit for me in any journalism scandal is how much do you know about the legal side of undercover reporting? Oh, I am so glad you asked. So, section one, uh, subsection V4B. See, this is my jam. (laughs) So, what do you think the rules might be around fancy dress when it comes to undercover reporting? Oh, Man, I had never even thought about this. I presume any accessories you pay for yourself, but the rest is on the business. (laughs) What about pretending to be an Arab leader? Do it. Do it lots. Don't think about it. Absolutely morally fine. Am I right in thinking we are talking about the fake shake, Emily? Yes, we absolutely are. I'm going to tell you the story of the most ruthless investigative journalist in the country. Thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled. This is episode one. From Robes to Riches. November 1981, Selly Park, Birmingham. 18 year old Massa Mahmood edges through the rundown estate, checks the back of his hand for the right flat number. Reaching the scuffed door, he makes sure his micro cassette recorder is properly hidden in his inside pocket. Then he takes a deep breath and knocks. I'm presuming that this is a wiretap situation. Maybe I'm ruining the whole episode. But what I would say is, if I'm going undercover, I want something slicker and Mm. smaller than a micro cassette recorder, which sounds huge. I'll repeat again. 18-year-old Selly Park (laughs) is budget wire, okay? Okay. 
Moments later, he's ushered into the flat by a casually dressed Asian guy of a similar age, who looks Mahmood up and down suspiciously. I'm Wasim's brother, Mahmood blurts out. Anil frowns. Thought he didn't want any tapes? Uh, I don't know. I changed his mind, I guess. I'm just the errand boy. To Mahmood's relief, the man, Anil Khan, shrugs. Mahmood feels his heartbeat quicken. He's one step closer to getting what he wants, an exclusive. For as long as he can remember, Mahmood has wanted to follow in his parents' footsteps and become a journalist. As Pakistani immigrants who arrived in Birmingham in the 1960s, they worked hard to become pillars of the Asian community and even setting up the UK's first Urdu newspaper. When his brother was seen mentioned over dinner last night that an old school friend was dealing in pirate videos, Mahmood saw his chance to get the scoop he's been after. OK, the very young people that I'm sure listen to this podcast might not even be aware of the pirate video game of our youth. Emily. Oh, unpack it. So now you've got your streaming, you've mm-hmm. got your illegal torrents. But then it was just like someone's uncle with a camcorder recording the cinema as somebody got up and said, yeah, I'll have an almond magnum in the yep. middle of the film. Yep. Or ate popcorn very loudly, yep. stood up, left, yeah. came back, complained about the toilets. Absolutely. <laughs> All of that is just adding to the texture of your viewing experience. Video nasties are big national news right now. If Mahmood can expose this guy, not only will it make a good story, his father, who is now a magistrate, will be proud as punch too. He walks into the living room where several of Anil's friends sit around smoking. One of them hands Mahmood a beer. Mahmood isn't a practicing Muslim, but he's always stuck to the no alcohol rule. But right now, he's so nervous he takes a big gulp. So... Wasim wondered what else you have other than Evil Dead. I can get you anything you want. Nasties, porn, snuff movies. Anil goes over to a large entertainment unit and opens a door. Behind it sit two VHS video recorders and a TV set. The image on screen makes my mood blush. It's from a hardcore porn movie doing the rounds called Animal Farm. I just don't want to know. Mahmood feels in his pocket for the camera he brought, frustrated. There's no chance of him getting photos or anything here with so many people in the room. Instead, he decides to push for more details. So, who else do you sell these to? Best money comes from corner shops. Gets him a few extra quid, innit? Corner shops? Which shops? At least half of Selly. Now Anil eyes Mahmood with suspicion. What's it matter to you? Mahmood's heart races. I, uh. Before he can think, he hears himself stutter. Look, I- I'm not really here for Wasim. I'm here for me. I want to help with distribution for a cut. Polly's such a waste of time. I want action, more money. Mahmood doesn't even have to lie now. He meant every word of that last part. He holds Anil's gaze. All right, let's try you out. Sorry, for somebody who was highly suspicious, that's a very, very quick hiring. Do you know what I think it is? Wasim. Probably good standing in the group. Hi there, little brother. Social status. Yeah, give him a shot. Sure. If he does it wrong, kill him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> speculation, of course. <laughs> Try him out. Uh, Three-month probation process. Um, if we like what you do, you'll get promoted. If not, execution. <laughs> well, I was hoping that that was what was happening on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's high stakes, Emily. It's high stakes. Why do you think you haven't heard from Phil Wang in a while? <laughs> A few hours later, Mahmood drops off several VHS tapes to a corner shop owner, who pays him in cash. By the end of the evening, Mahmood has visited five local shops. He's got more than what he hoped for. The nervous excitement of going undercover is a thrill he never expected. And the payoff? Potentially bringing down an entire network of criminals. On his own doorstep. Now all he has to do is sell the story. The following evening, November 1981, Selly Park, Birmingham. In the living room of their smart red-bricked house, Sultan Mahmood eyes the clock as his wife, Shamim, serves up dinner for him and Wasim. His stomach is rumbling after a long day at court, but he doesn't want to start eating without both his sons at the table. The door slams and Mahmood rushes in. Sultan can't remember the last time his youngest boy looked so excited. I've done it. I've sold my first story to the Evening Mail. Sultan smiles, impressed. The Birmingham Evening Mail is one of the biggest titles in the West Midlands. 
That's wonderful. What's the story? So just to be clear, have yes. the family spent time in like Sicily for a bit and then right. they've moved to Birmingham? Like- okay. I see what's happening here. They're all in Birmingham. Sultan's been there 20 years mm. by way of Milan. <laughs> He's so international. I think probably, if I'm honest, his father had quite a strong Asian accent and I am half Indian and I'm not willing to grace you with it. So for now, this Italian, Brummy, Cockney man (laughs) is Mamu's father. Okay? How do you sound more Brummy now? (laughs) That's so wonderful. What's the story? (laughs) Might. Mahmood pulls several pages of notes from his coat pocket, proudly holds them up. That stuff Racine told us the other night about his mate telling video nasties. I've written an expose about the whole thing. Racine grabs the notes from Mamu's hand. Fucking hell, Maz. You've named Anil. You've listed his bloody address. Racine, you will not swear at this table. Let me see the story. Sultan feels the blood drain from his face as he reads. His son hasn't just named Anil. He's named several of his own friends too. Good, upstanding members of the community. Some are practically family. Then why are they buying pirated videos? We all got needs. <laughs> Covering your nostril was a lovely detail that the listeners can't enjoy. But you obviously did like a jokey song voice, but you were like, I still need to find my note, baby. <laughs> my ears are covered by headphones. I was like, new old. Sultan holds his head in his hands. Maz... What have you done? Anil and his mates are breaking the law. They all are. Sultan slams his fist on the table. I have worked to give you opportunities that others can only dream of. And this is how you repay me. Bringing shame to the family. He stares at his son. Please tell me this hasn't gone into tonight's paper. No, tomorrow's, but go there immediately. This very moment, tell them to retract the story. To Sultan's despair, Mahmood shakes his head. I've already sold the story. I can't. I won't. You can and you will. You are a grown man. It's time you start acting like one. He catches Shamim's eye, then adds, Get the story stopped or you don't come back to this house. This is kind of devastating and it is a bit of a British scandal trope, which is often young men just want to make their daddies proud. Yeah, but you can't make your dad proud by shaming Uncle Steve. The same evening, November 1981, Birmingham. Mahmood waves his hand through the fog of the cigarette smoke hanging over the bustling office of the evening mail. The sound of clacking typewriters and ringing phones fills the room. The paper's editor stares at him, incredulous. He want me to spike the story? Mahmood nods, embarrassed. He knows his dad is right. He can't put his brother in danger. Can't shame the entire community. But the editor shakes his head. No way. We're running it on the front page. The nationals will pick it up for sure. Mahmood stares. I've already had two London editors on the line. Possible syndication deals. Mahmood never imagined it would be front page news, let alone a national interest story. He feels panic set in. He looks up in disbelief as the editor chuckles. I can't remember such a strong story from a cub reporter. Mahmood realises the editor isn't laughing at him, but with him. You've got potential, Maz, and I might have an opening. Mahmood is momentarily blindsided. Is he being offered a job? Yes, at the same time as being shunned by your community. Sometimes they giveth, sometimes they taketh away. If he can't get the story pulled, he has to find a compromise. Can you take my name off it then? I need to remain anonymous. The editor looks perplexed. They're interrupted by a reporter shouting across the room with details of a nearby hit and run. As the whole office bursts into action, Mahmood feels the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. He loves the energy of this place. It's gang of dishevelled misfits, the urgency. He can't shake the feeling this is where he's meant to be. Maz, this story is running with or without your name in the byline. I don't care. He watches as the editor turns and shouts to a young reporter. John, this might just be your lucky day. Look, I don't have all day, Maz. What's it going to be? Name on or off? Mahmood thinks again about his dad's threat. Decides he has to come round eventually. So he takes a breath. On. 
Half an hour later, Mahmoud's back in his kitchen, looking across the kitchen table. His mum is in tears. He jumps as he hears another door slam shut. I don't want to see that boy again. I want him out of my house by the time I return. He's a disgrace to the community. Mahmoud refuses to cry. In fact, he's going to take his dad's advice. He's going to act like a man, stand by his decision. It's time he follows his dream. But first, that means finding a place to live. Four years later, July 1985, Holborn Circus, London. Clutching his cuttings book, Mahmoud tries to look confident as he strides into the offices of the Sunday people. With its glass cubicles and electric typewriters, Mahmoud is desperate to bag a job on the news desk of this national newspaper. For the last four years, Mahmoud has worked tirelessly to prove that choosing this career over his family was worth it, exposing countless cases of corruption and greed. He's proud as the news editor flicks through his cuttings book, but he's not met with the enthusiasm he hoped for. I like your stuff, but I've seen it all a million times before. What's your USP? What can you offer us that none of that lot can? He nods to the long line of fellow interviewees lined up outside. Mahmoud suspects most have more experience and qualifications than he does. He glances up at the television above the editor's head. It's showing the news story that broke earlier, a riot in Hansworth. Mahmoud watches as streets from his childhood fill the screen. He's been nurturing relationships with gangs in this area for months, aware that racial tensions between Asian youths and the police were growing. The editor looks at his watch. Mahmoud, I don't have all bloody day. Mahmoud blurts out the first thing that enters his head. Give me 48 hours and I'll get you a better story than any of them can. The editor mulls it over, then agrees. Mahmoud feels a surge of relief. Now, thinking about this with the 2023 head on, this really wouldn't be possible now, would it? If you'd had your name stamped on an undercover story, your name would be mud, you wouldn't be able to infiltrate any group ever again probably because your face would also be attached to your name at this point exactly it would be everywhere people would be able to google you find out who you were find out where you've been but in this age in 1985 you can just slip into your next story but two hours later he's shocked by what greets him in Hansworth. flames lick the sky as petrol bombs hit shops rows of cars smolder riot officers pour out of police vans Mahmoud spots the lads he's befriended, a bunch of guys throwing bottles at the police. He's never gone this far undercover before, never put himself in danger. He sprints past the officers and joins the group throwing bottles. Give us one of those, will you? One of the lads gives Mahmoud a smile of recognition and obliges. Aim it at one of the pigs, yeah? Mahmoud hesitates before hurling it at an approaching riot officer. He's never felt so scared. He watches a BBC van pull up. Safely ensconced behind the police cordon, they can't get close to the real action. And in that moment, Mahmoud realises this is his USP. He stays with the gang for the next hour before slipping away. When he's sure he's far enough from the scene, he finds a payphone and calls the People's News Editor. I've just been running with a bunch of rioters in Hansworth. I can give you an exclusive view from the inside. Interviews, locations, a behind-the-scenes expose. I've got local knowledge your other reporters can only dream of. Keen to seal the deal, he pushes further. But the Sunday Mirror's already interested, so if you don't want it... The news editor cuts in. What if we start you on the news desk today? Do we get the story? Mahmoud is shaking with excitement as he hangs up. He steps out of the phone box and looks around. His undercover journalism has just won him a seat at the big table. Now he's going to make it count by becoming the most successful reporter Fleet Street has ever seen. I'm really fascinated by him because he has some really admirable character traits. He's unbelievably ambitious. Mm -hmm. He's obviously really skilled and adept at embedding himself in these gangs. But obviously his driving force is the story without any consideration for, if you want to think of it as collateral damage or the lives of other people around it. I mean, he's not really bothered about his own emotional well-being. You know, his family's (laughs) gone. Like, he's rejected there. He's been ostracised from his community. I think this reminds me of Spy Cops, another series we did on British Scandal. 
And I think if you have to do anything undercover, there's a real pathology around that kind of person. And you definitely get a taste for the adrenaline. And you definitely have to have this sort of one track mind. And if this is the way you are choosing to operate, you can use that power, that knowledge, that access to all these people for real good. Or you can use it for bad. Or you can do good things in a really bad way. Oh, now I'm intrigued. As you write your life story, you're far from finished. Are you looking to close the book on your job? Maybe turn a page in your career. Be Continued at the Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies. Our professional master's degrees and certificates are designed to meet you where you are and take you where you want to go. At Georgetown SCS, the learning never stops, and neither do you. Write your next chapter. Be continued at scs.georgetown.edu slash podcast. Being an actual royal is never about finding your happy ending. But the worst part is, if they step out of line or fall in love with the wrong person, it changes the course of history. I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And I'm Brooke Ziffrin. We've been telling the stories of the rich and famous on the hit Wondery show, Even the Rich, and talking about the latest celebrity news on Rich and Daily. We're going all over the world on our new show, Even the Royals. We'll be diving headfirst into the lives of the world's kings, queens, and all the wannabes in their orbit throughout history. Think succession meets the crown meets real life. We're going to pull back the gilded curtain and show how royal status might be bright and shiny, but it comes at the expense of, well, everything else. Like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Even the Royals early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. November 1991, Wapping, London. Mahmood tries to hide his excitement as he enters the editor's office at News of the World. With a typical circulation of four million a week, no tabloid has more influence in Britain, and Mahmood has just landed a job on its crime desk. He listens as a member of team kicks off morning conference. It's a sex scandal about the married Secretary of State for National Heritage, David Meller. I've had a tip-off he's been playing away with an actress. Apparently, he insists on wearing a Chelsea football strip when he bonks her. Mahmood's heart races. This would be the perfect story to start on. It's dog-eat-dog here, and Mahmood needs to make his mark. But before he can volunteer, the investigations editor names several of his colleagues to follow it up. Mahmood isn't about to give up. He spent the last couple of weeks diligently preparing pictures. He jumps in with one. I've got something juicy through my contacts at the Met. A bunch of corrupt coppers who've been taking backhanders from a vice ring. I've been working on it for a while. Actually, I had a different story in mind for you, Maz. Mahmood feels the table's eyes on him. Adrenaline courses through his veins. It's game time. It's a fake marriage for visa scam operating within the Indian community. I'm thinking Maz goes round as many registry officers as he can in one day and we take photos of him with all his different brides. There are chuckles and murmurs of approval. But the last thing Mahmood wants is his photo splashed all over the paper in the name of some half-baked story. He tries to splutter a diplomatic response. OK, I've done immigration stuff before, so maybe a different way of... But then another reporter chips in. We could call it wedded blitz. Everyone in the room laughs. OK, so this is like a 90s tabloid bingo card. We've got Asian journalists being pigeonholed, uh, immigration panic <laughs> and women being used as props in your story. And that's a full house. Hey! Mahmood's heart sinks. He's being pushed into a fluff piece because of the colour of his skin. He can picture his brother sniggering at the pictures of him all dressed up with fake brides, his dad shaking his head in despair. Yeah, that's not the worst of it. Also, all of the gangs that you've infiltrated, seeing you in the paper and then being like, that guy was undercover. And his dad shaking his (laughs) head with despair. But he knows if he refuses, it will be a black mark against his name on his first day. He looks at the editors around the table, all white, of course. He forces a smile. Sounds good. Mahmood excuses himself to go and get a glass of water. 
As he walks, he looks up at the framed splashes on the newspaper's wall. Christine Keeler during the Profumo Affair. Listen to our series on that. Charles and Diana on the rocks. Listen to our series on that. Exclusive photos of Madonna marrying Sean Penn. Not British. Mahmood knows he just has to work even harder, chase every lead, be doubly as good as the other reporters. He'll refuse to be pigeonholed and he'll make it onto that wall if it kills him. In fact, he won't stop until the entire office is filled with his front page splashes. Three years later, Birmingham. Mahmood adjusts his tie and fixes a grin on his face as he approaches the imposing entrance of the Metropole Hotel. He reaches the revolving door, only for an outstretched arm to appear, blocking his way. Excuse me, sir, do you have a reservation? Mahmood looks up at the doorman, offended. Of course. The doorman looks him up and down, unconvinced. He folds his arms. Can I take your name? Mahmoud inwardly sighs. He knows they'll find no record of him if they check. He's come up here after receiving a tip-off that the hotel's concierge team have been running a sex service for its male guests. The trouble is, even with his slick back hair and hired moss bros suit, he's struggling to be inconspicuous in this place's typical wealthy, middle-aged clientele. All Mahmoud can do is offer a cheeky smile. Okay, you've got me. Could I just come in for a drink? The doorman offers a withering look. Mahmood finally gives up and returns to the van where his photographer is waiting. He's about to get in when his colleague points out the motor show at the next door NEC. Fucking hell, Maz, is that an F40? Imagine the chicks I'd get if I had a Ferrari. How about we check that out instead? But Mahmood isn't listening. Instead, he watches a stretch limousine pulling up. A smartly dressed driver opens the door and ushers out a young Arab sheikh who is followed by a burly minder and several other members of staff. The security guards outside the NEC quickly run over to greet him, ushering him inside like his royalty. The kernel of an idea begins to form in his head. He turns to the photographer. I think I know how we can get into the hotel. 20 minutes later, Mahmood is at the back of an Islamic bookshop in Coventry Road. They have a selection of Arab robes hanging on a rail. The shopkeeper gives his best sales patter. They come with a headscarf and rings. It's all included for 9 99 brother. I can do you some beads as well if you want. For 9 99 If you want. Oh my God. The photographer leans close to Mahmood. You sure this is cool, Maz? Mahmood rolls his eyes. Didn't think you need to grow a pair, mate. In truth, Mahmood does wonder if he's crossing a line. He lets it go immediately and tells himself it's just another fancy dress. Another way of working undercover. He hurries into a tiny cubicle and slips into the robes. As he places the beads around his neck, the uneasy feeling returns, but then he looks in the mirror. And he looks banging. He really looks so fit. It suits him. <laughs> So, might be morally dubious, but I look the business. Mahmood's eyes widen as he takes in the transformation. He barely recognises himself. He doesn't just look completely different. He feels empowered somehow, like a superhero, putting on his cape for the first time. As he steps out of the cubicle and onto the shop floor, he sees a smile form on his colleague's face. Time to put his plan to the test. An hour later, Birmingham city centre. Approaching the Metropole once again, robes and kefir blowing in the breeze, Mahmood glances back at his colleague. He's now transformed too. Wearing Mahmood's moss bros suit to play the role of a sheikh's minder and pulling a couple of newly bought suitcases behind him. This is like a mad heist movie. A, good job that the suit fits the minder and that he's not like 6'4 and Mahmood's like (laughs) 3'2". It feels like that sequence in a film where they pull back the dressing room curtain and they've done the switcheroo. Yeah, and also, can we just give a call out to the suitcases? (laughs) Yeah. This bookshop was providing. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) I hope they bought some paperbacks too in case they have to wait. Mahmood enters the sliding doors and spots the same doorman he encountered earlier. He swears under his breath. He'd hoped the door staff would have changed shifts by now. But then the doorman steps forward, bows his head 
and ushers him into the luxurious lobby. The manager races over. Shit, Mas, what now? Mahmood has no idea. He wonders if he should bow, utter assalam alaikum. Mahmood is about to formulate his best Arabic accent when, luckily, the manager speaks first. Welcome to the Metropole. Are you here to use the bar and restaurant or will you be staying with us? Mahmood hears a note of hope in the manager's voice. He's still here to investigate the concierge's sex service and he suspects a drink at the bar won't cut it. He decides to style this out. He puffs out his chest, finds himself speaking in broken English with an indistinct Middle Eastern accent. We require your best suite for one night. To Mahmoud's delight, he's led past the queue at the check-in desk and taken straight to the penthouse. Gosh, they treat Russians well, don't they? (laughs) Indistinct, we lean on... That's the operative, indistinct. (laughs) I cannot stress enough how indistinct his upbringing was. (laughs) Mahmoud slowly takes in every inch of its plush interior, while his colleague beams with delight. Did we really just do that? Minutes later, there's a knock on the room door. Mahmoud's heart pounds. He readjusts his robes and sends his colleague to answer. Is there anything the Metropole can do to make the stay here more enjoyable? Mahmoud eyes the photographer nervously, gives him a subtle nod. Actually... He wondered if some girls might entertain him in his suite. Of course, sir. Mahmood is stunned. He glances at his colleague in disbelief at how easy it all is. They just have time to set up the necessary recording devices before a succession of high-class sex workers are escorted in. Mahmood takes a look in the mirror as his colleague exchanges payment with the concierge. Because in truth... He's no longer thinking about the story he's filing tonight. He's already wondering who else might fall for his new guise. Fake Shake could be the making of him. October 1998, Spain. In his luxury suite at the Marbella Club, Mahmoud watches in horror as a massive flame shoots up from the coals of his shisha pipe. While his entourage try to stop the soft furnishings catching fire, he puts his head in his hands. This sting has got off to a disastrous start. Mahmood has been scrambling around for a big splash since he made the fake shake his alter ego. He has the full support of the crime desk, but right now he's being outshone by his colleagues. The showbiz team are celebrating after breaking a story about Blue Peter presenter Richard Bacon taking coke. This was huge. So big. For our listeners that aren't as old as me and Emily, no offence, um, <laughs> who don't remember this, former Kids TV presenter, Blue Peter presenter, Richard Bacon, was taken down. And this was massively controversial. It was everywhere. And for a long time. And it is the first time I remember, though we didn't have the vocabulary for it then, someone being cancelled. Yes, he really did just disappear for a while there. Mahmoud is following a tip-off on some football bigwigs flying to Spain to meet with sex workers. And he's only doing it because the paper's editor, Phil Hall, is sports mad. Mahmoud doesn't know a damn thing about football. He spent the whole flight over learning the long list of players, managers and recent transfer deals, and he's still lost. But as the last of the smoke is being waved out of the window, Newcastle chairman Freddie Shepherd and his deputy, Doug, enter the room. Mahmoud carefully adjusts his robes, which he recently upgraded to a more expensive white jalaba with a gold embroidered robe on the top, commonly worn by royalty in the Middle East. He whispers to a colleague, leave the champagne, break out the brandy, let's get them as pissed as quickly as possible. To Mahmoud's relief, it soon becomes clear the two men have knocked back plenty of champagne on the plane. They're already half cut. He's tickled when Freddy slags off some of the club's biggest names. Alan Shearer is one of the most boring people he can meet. We call him Mary Poppins. He's almost as bad as Kevin Keegan, a.k.a. Shirley Temple. Stop using people as nicknames who very much aren't boring. Mary Poppins literally flies through time and space on an umbrella that can talk. And then Shirley Temple, didn't she have just like the wildest, maddest, saddest young life? I'm sure this is what my mood's thinking. He's like, we can't use any of this. Those are all fantastic people. (laughs) But who are your most difficult players, Freddie? Well, we were happy to get rid of Cole. Lucky that, don't you think? He didn't fulfil expectations, I suppose. 
Freddy and Doug exchange a look. Then Freddy throws his head back and laughs. Not for man you, he didn't. As Freddy goes on, it becomes clear he's referring to star striker Andy Cole. The club sold him to Manchester United for £7 million, but he was out immediately afterwards because of a knee operation. We knew he needed the op, but we didn't tell them that. Sold him before it could hurt us. Mahmood can't believe how indiscreet these guys are. And that's saying something considering we're in the room with a fake shake. (laughs) It's time to up the ante. What can we do around here for entertainment? Doug grins. There's a club down the road called Me Lady Palace. You heard of it? I haven't, but I really want to go. An hour later, they're in a dimly lit brothel filled with gilt couches and erotic statues. Freddie and Doug order champagne and leer at scantily clad girls before taking them off for private groping sessions. Mahmood already has more than enough to bring these guys down, but he knows he can push further. When Freddie returns, Mahmood gives him a nudge. These girls all seem to love you. You have the magic touch. Freddy grins, falling for the flattery. Oh, we've had beautiful women all over. You need to travel for it. Newcastle girls are all ugly dogs. England's full of them. We've had penthouse pets, the fucking lot, the best in the world. Oh, he is an absolute charmer. And I would just like to point out to his credit that that was a verbatim quote. Freddy adds that he and Doug come to Marbella because they are free here. We have to watch the British papers. In the UK, we can't play like this, we'd be sacked. Mahmood takes a sip of his drink, feels the anger rising inside him. These guys have no respect for their families, the players or the fans. They think they can act however they want, with impunity. But they never reckoned with Mahmood. This sting is far from being a mistake. It's his ticket to the big time. He's going to cast his net wide, expose the hypocrisies of the rich and powerful, and become the avenging angel of the tabloid world. I love the sentiment. I love the energy. Mm -hmm. But dare I say, he's not necessarily the person who should be deciding what is right and wrong and where that moral line is. He's done some dubious stuff. You think there's a bit of hypocrisy here? Potentially. Hey, I'm Michelle Beadle. And I'm Peter Rosenberg. Hey, Peter, uh, tell the people about our new podcast. Right. It's called Over the Top. And we cover the biggest topics in sports and pop culture using Royal Rumble rules. That means we'll start with two stories, toss one out on its ass, and dive into the other stories with ruthless aggression. Oh, but it never stops because every 90 seconds after that... Oh God, whose music is that? Another story comes down to the ring. Rinse and repeat until we arrive at the one most important thing on planet Earth that week. Yeah! Follow Over the Top on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Over the Top ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. For the record, this is not a wrestling podcast. No, no, but it is inspired by wrestling. Isn't everything inspired by wrestling, Beetle? Fair point. September 1999, Wapping, London. Shrouded in a hoodie, Mahmood sweeps into the News of the World office to cheers and applause. He revels in the adulation as editor Phil Hall proudly hands him his Reporter of the Year award. His Newcastle scoop went stratospheric. Shares in the club tumbled with £6.5 million wiped off its value. The only downside to keeping his face such a closely guarded secret is that Mahmood couldn't risk attending the ceremony to collect the gong himself. But picking it up isn't the only reason he's here. In Hall's office, he lists his demands. I want a pay rise. Goes without saying, Maz. And I want to be department head. Hall drums his fingers on the desk, considering it. Mahmood knows other, more senior reporters on the paper won't like that. He doesn't care. He deserves it. Fair enough. Investigations editor, it is. I also want a proper investigations unit made up of only my people with a bigger budget. Hall shakes his head. Come on, Maz. I've given you a budget that exceeds the showbiz desk. You've even got your own driver. 
This is where he just turns completely egomaniacal and he's like, I don't have a driver. The Sheikh has a driver. It's like, <laughs> oh no, he's lost it. He's gone completely Dilali. Mahmood leans forward. He's worked harder than any other journalist in this office to get to where he is today. He points to his Newcastle splash on the wall outside Hall's office. Tycoon turmoil. Shepherd's secrets exposed. You know how much publicity this Newcastle scoop is bringing us. Mahmood sees Hall avert his eyes. And it's all because of the fake shake. He's a brand, my brand, and I've only just begun. Hall darkens, but he's clearly conflicted. This is above my pay grade. This one is for the CEO. If the fake isn't appreciated here, he could always go somewhere else. Mahmood stays on him. He refuses to be dismissed as he was in his younger years. I'll get back to you. Mahmood leaves the office and takes a breath to calm his nerves. He hopes he didn't push it too far, but he knows his worth to this paper. He heads out into the lunchtime bustle of Fleet Street. He ducks onto Blackfriars Bridge and lets the salty air of the Thames hit his face. He's on the cusp of getting everything he ever dreamed of. But there's still one part of the puzzle missing, and it's going to prove much harder than just persuading an editor. Selly Park, Birmingham, a few hours later. Mahmood's car glides to a stop on the empty street. He looks at the Reporter of the Year award on the seat to his left. Mahmood adjusts his jacket as he knocks on his parents' door. His mum answers and envelops him in a hug. Mazza, I've missed you so much. Mahmood leans in to kiss her as he takes in the familiar smell and old wallpaper. Mahmood peers nervously down the hallway. All he can hear is the lone sound of a television in the back room. Is anyone else in? He looks at his mum and smiles, but he glimpses an anxious look in her eye. He's in the back. Entering the living room, Mahmood isn't sure what to say, but Sultan gestures to Wasim to turn the television off. For a moment, the three of them sit and stand in silence. Wasim can't help himself. The prodigal son returns. Mahmood's hackles rise. He chooses to ignore him. Instead, he lifts his bag and takes out a small gift box which he hands to his dad. Mahmood watches nervously as Sultan opens it and takes out a Rolex watch. Holy guacamole! Sultan delicately fingers the watcher's crown. He turns it in his hand, admires the bracelet. Mahmood knows Sultan has always admired the craftsmanship of Rolexes. It's a calculated gift, one chosen for more than just its cost. What turgid story did you have to write to pay for that? Still selling out your friends? Yes, but do you like your Rolex? <laughs> it seems like, where's my Rolex? <laughs> Mahmood's nerves rise as Sultan remains stony silent. He wants nothing more than to pull out his trophy and throw it at Wasim, to shout, at least I've had the fucking courage to pursue what I believe in. But instead, he quietly mutters, prefer people like Freddie Shepherd in charge, would you? Prefer men like that to call British women dogs. His mum steps forward. Mahmood, please. Mahmood realises his words have a bitter edge. He didn't want this exchange to play out this way. He's about to turn to his mum, apologise, when Sultan jumps in. Mazar is right. Those football bosses were foul-mouthed perverts. Then adds, as was that concierge ring at the Metropole. Mahmood looks at his dad, stunned. Sultan must have been following his progress at the paper all this time. You're doing good work, son. Think I'm going to cry? Don't. Mahmood feels a tear in his eye. Thankfully, somebody's got a heart. <laughs> he turns away and wipes his face as a message on his phone beeps through from his editor, Hall. Boss has signed off on your requests. Own unit, handpicked team, annual budget of £500,000. Congrats. Better keep bringing the goods, Maz. Mahmood doesn't have time to process the information. Did you know Rolex watches use their own proprietary stainless steel alloy called 904L? Mahmood smiles. He's missed his dad's geekiness. He's missed his voice. He walks over and admires the Rolex on Sultan's wrist. Sorry, is this episode sponsored by Rolex? 
How many times do we want to say Rolex? Then he catches his mum's smile in the reflection of the Rolex watch. <laughs> Mahmood knows he needs to tread carefully, but for the first time in years, he finally feels at peace. He's back in the family fold. He has the respect of Fleet Street and a budget most journalists can only dream of. But most importantly, he has the respect of his dad. Nothing and no one can stop him now. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Sam Is That Audio, this is the first episode in our series, Fake Shake. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read News of the World, Fake Shakes and Royal Trappings by Peter Burden, Confessions of a Fake Shake by Maza Mahmood and the Fake Shake Prime Video. British Scandal is hosted by me, Alice Levine. And temporarily me, Emily lloyd Saney. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Sam Is That Audio. Written by Wendy Granditer. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Emily Lloyd Saney. Our story editor is James Maniak. Sound design by Rich Evans. Music supervisor is Scott Velasquez for Free Son Sync. For Samizdat, our producer is Chika Ayres. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. For Wondery, our series producer is Theodora Leloudis. And our managing producer is Rachel Sibley. Executive producers for Wondery are Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louie. Hi, listeners. I'm Donnie Dust, and I'm here to tell you about our new podcast, Rescue. Go deep into the heart of the world's most astonishing rescue stories, told by the people who were there. I'll never forget his words to me. They struck me like a knife. He said, Billy, nine guys are missing, and we think they're trapped under your farm. Marvel at the lengths people will go to preserve the most sacred of things, life. At any point, the transmission's going to quit, and we're going to crash in the water, and we're going to die. Because... Once the engines quit, we probably wouldn't survive. Join me, Donnie Dust, for Rescue. Defying fate, defining heroes. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.